There are many songs that I treasure. Some of them are worship songs. You might sing with a worship band or hear on the radio. There are many hymns, like the one we just sang, is, is a song, is a hymn that I love. There are other songs that aren't really Christian songs at all. I just grew up hearing and I love them and they've made an impact on my life. Many songs have made an impact in one way or the other. There's one song that I really just discovered just a few years ago that shakes me every time I hear it. It's a song some of you may be familiar with. It's Simon and Garfunkel's Hazy Shades of Winter. If you haven't heard that song, Hazy Shade of Winter, before, the Bengals redid it in the 80s, but it wasn't nearly as good. It's the story of a poet, the story of a writer who suddenly realizes that his life is nearing the end, and that he squandered the talent that he had. He never set goals, that he lived with no purpose in his life. We can go to the next slide, it has some of the lyrics of the song towards the end. Seasons change with the scene. I'm not going to sing it. Uh, seasons change with the scenery, weaving time in a tapestry. Won't you stop and remember me at any convenient time? Funny how my memory skips while looking over manuscripts of unpublished rhyme, drinking my vodka and lime. I look around. Leaves are brown now. And the sky is a hazy shade of winter. Look around, leaves are brown. There's a patch of snow on the ground. And that song affects me because it's about somebody who, throughout his entire life, has had this talent. He's, he's written poems. He's just kind of lived carefree, thinking there will always be more time in the future to do those things. There'll be time to get published. There'll be time to set goals. I'm in the springtime of my life. But then in the song recognizes that the, the, the winter sky and the patch of snow is a metaphor for, no, I don't have as much time as I thought. And what have I done with what I've been given? <laughs> it's a song that every time I hear it, I have to ask myself, am I wasting opportunities? In my life? Am I leaving things undone? Am I setting myself up for at some point having the same reaction of this man in the song? Am I setting myself up for regrets? Am I using my talents to their full extent? Am I living without purpose? We all need purpose in our life. We can go to the next slide. This is a quote I found from Ross Parmenter. He said, The need for devotion to something outside ourselves is even more profound than the need for companionship. If we are not to go to pieces or wither away, we must have some purpose in life, for no man can live for himself alone. Purpose. Today we finish up our year-long series in the book of 2 Corinthians. And we're going to do something that I very rarely do. We're going to look at one verse today. We are in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. As Paul is drawing his letter to a close... He says this. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Or if you have the older NIV, he says, uh, finally, brothers, uh, goodbye. He says, aim for perfection. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. He says, aim for perfection. Aim for perfection. Now, over the sermon series, 
from time to time we've used maybe an archery target or, or a dartboard as kind of a, a metaphor for what we're looking for in the Christian life. And we are looking to not be satisfied just being anywhere on the board, but we're aiming for the bullseye in life. Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, it's been many years since I've really played darts, but we're going to see how this goes here. As I try to aim for the bullseye. Oh, no, that's not right. Ah, close. Didn't get it. But we're aiming for perfection. That's what Paul tells the Corinthians to do. And as we think of that, we put that in a spiritual sense, your first thought might be an objection that says, but Pastor Jeff, that's not possible. In fact, you've stood behind this pulpit many times and told us it's just not possible. It's not fair for Paul to say aim for perfection. In Major League Baseball history, there's only been 24 perfect games thrown. We can go to the next slide here. There's a list of all of the pitchers that have pitched a perfect game in Major League Baseball. Just 24 over 100 and, well, since 1880, 150 almost years. A perfect game means that 27 batters go up, 27 batters get out. There's no walks, there's no hits. Nobody reaches on an error. There's no run scored. Every person that comes to bat for a team sits down having not accomplished their goal 24 times. But I'll tell you that even in these perfect games, not every pitch was perfect. In fact, there's usually at least one defensive play during the game that saves it. In fact, I know I've told the story before of when Eva was two years old and Mark Burley from my White Sox, they do actually have a baseball team despite their record this year. <laughs> if you don't have any, the worst record in the history of baseball is the Chicago White Sox. But they used to be good and they had a pitcher named Mark Burley who when Eva was two days old threw a perfect game that was saved in the ninth inning by an outfielder named Dwayne Wise literally jumping over the fence to save a home run to save the perfect game, and Jamie had just fallen asleep for the first time in two days, and I think I woke her up. Sorry, babe. <laughs> I was so excited. But that usually happens. There's some defensive gem that saves the day. Even perfect games aren't really perfect. But we call them that. Because what we define as perfect isn't always perfect. But Paul then says, aim for perfection. Now, we do need to understand that Paul, when he says aim for perfection, he's not saying be perfectionistic, because there's a difference. A, a perfectionist is somebody that demands perfection of themselves, and, and then they feel like failures when they inevitably don't achieve it. Jamie and I were talking with one of Eva's friends a few weeks ago, a, a high-achieving high school student. Uh, who said, I just know I failed that quiz today. And Jamie's question to this friend was, did you fail it or did you get an A minus? To which the student said, what's the difference? <laughs> right? Some people are just that driven. We've got to get 100%. 91 is just not going to fly. Right? And, and some of us are wired that way, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but we do need to remember that one of Satan's oldest tricks and most effective tricks is to convince us that we have to be flawless. And then when we inevitably fall short, he accuses us of being worthless failures. It's one of his most effective techniques. Paul, when he says aim for perfection, he's saying aim for the bullseye, but he's not saying torture yourselves. That's not what he's saying. Nor does Paul really believe that we can achieve that perfection that we're aiming for. We can go to the next slide. This is another passage that we've used many times, right? I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness should be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. What's Paul saying? He's saying, I know you're not going to be perfect. Because if you could be perfect, if you could earn your relationship with God, if you could buy your own entrance into heaven 
by being righteous and doing all the right things all the time, Jesus would not have come. Jesus came precisely because we couldn't reach perfection on our own. We, when it comes to our own walk with God, our own righteousness, we fail to hit the bullseye every single day. And that's where the grace of God comes in. Our sin was atoned for at the cross. Through the cross of Jesus, uh, Jesus takes our flawed efforts and he puts them into the bullseye. Not because we've done anything right, but because Jesus was able to live that perfect bullseye life for us. He accomplished through his perfect life and then dying on the cross for our sins, uh, he attained what we could not. We could not attain that perfection, but Jesus' perfection is assigned to us. It's like a spiritual copy and paste. He, takes, he copies Jesus' righteousness and pastes it onto our file and says, yep, you're good. That's grace. But Paul says to aim for perfection. It's a goal that you strive for. And although you won't get it, you'll come a whole lot closer than if you don't try. I mean, there are some Christians, let's be honest, there are some Christians that when it comes to their, their own righteousness and, and trying to the aim, for, as long as they can get anywhere within that triple ring, they're happy. Maybe they're not even shooting for the bullseye, but I just want to not be out here. I want to be somewhere in here. And that's not what we're called to. And then there's others that are just, they just seem to not aim at all. They're almost like the guy that shoots the arrow, and then wherever it lands, they just draw a target around it and say, that's good enough. <laughs> that's how some people live their lives. But brothers and sisters, if you are a concert pianist, and you are there, go, have a, a big concert uh, coming up, and you sit down behind the keyboard to play the piano at this concert, you don't go in there with the goal of, I just want to get 90% of the notes right. If I can get most of the dynamics, the loudness and the softness, if I can get most of them, I'll, I'll be happy. Or if I can um, get the rhythm mostly right. That's not the way a concert pianist goes about things. They're wanting to play it perfectly. But if you're on stage and you're playing and you accidentally hit a G instead of an A, you don't just, oh, that's it, I didn't make it, stop and walk off the stage or decide, you know what, I'm just going to switch songs and play something a lot easier because <laughs> maybe I can achieve it then. No. You keep going. You make a mistake, you keep going. And you keep aiming for perfection even though you didn't get it. Paul said, forgetting what is behind and, and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I forget what's behind, and I'm just focused on whatever I did yesterday, I'm aiming for the bullseye today. That's the goal. So what do we need to do in order to hit the bullseye? So there's three things I want to share this morning that, as I look back at when I actually did play darts a lot, Usually just in my own basement, but I've practiced for a long time, every day. Three things that, lessons I learned from playing darts that I think can be applied to this passage that Paul is talking about in, in 2 Corinthians 13. The first is that you must be able to see your target. You have to be able to see your target. If you were in Sunday school last week, this illustration is going to sound familiar, but Literally, I wrote the sermon, and then Kim sent me, like, the, the next day, like, the preview for the lesson. I'm like, he just used this exact same illustration that I had already penned into this week's sermon. So bear with me if you heard this last, last Sunday. 1952, a woman named Florence Chadwick decided she was going to swim the 21 miles. Swim 21 miles. From Catalina Island off the coast of California to the California coast. Strong swimmer. Believed she could do it. She'd already swam the English Channel. She knew she could swim great distance. 
And on the day she did it, the water was bone chillingly cold. It was very cold. And there in California, believe it or not, if you've never been to California, the water's really cold because that water, that tide comes from Alaska. It's not going north, it's coming south. But the cold water was not a danger to her. What was a danger was fog. It was incredibly thick fog that day. So much fog, in fact, that she could barely see the boats that were right beside her that were there to keep away the sharks. She couldn't even see the boats that were just a few feet away from her. And as she swam, after 15 hours, she finally just gave up. I, I, she just said, I can't do it anymore. Her mom was in a boat next to her and said, no, keep going. You're almost there. Keep going. And, but she lost hope. And when she lost hope, her body gave up its strength. And she said, I, I can't do it. And she was pulled out of the water. After she got into the boat, she learned that she was only a half mile from shore. She made it 98% of the way to shore. But when you can't see your goal, it's very difficult to succeed. See, in Paul's visits to Corinth, in his letters, and we've looked at 2 Corinthians, Paul had shown the Corinthians where they were missing the target. And he gave them good correction. He gave them a good target to shoot for. And so now the question is whether they would respond. Paul says in verse 11, listen to my appeal. In other words, all the things I've been correcting you on, all the things I've been saying to you, put them into practice. Do something about it. Change what you're doing. But let's be honest, that can be hard. Because we don't like to admit when we're wrong, do we? I know I don't. And Paul was essentially asking the church in Corinth, you've got to admit that you've been doing some things wrong. It's time to admit that. It's time to correct your course. Look at the target. Taking individual responsibility can be difficult, but a church here in Corinth needs to take collective responsibility. Yeah, we've been doing wrong. We've allowed sin in our midst. We've allowed idolatry among even the church leadership. We've been catty with one another and divisive, and, and we've listened to people we should not have listened to. Paul said, you've got to take responsibility for that and listen to my appeal. Apologize to one another. Seek repentance. Seek reconciliation. Where this comes to for us is living by the word of God. Understanding what it says, understanding what it teaches, being humble enough to say, yeah, this is the target, and if I've been off target, I need to change. We need to change. We need to respond. Because wise is the man, and blessed is the church that can look at the word of God, take an honest assessment of where they are missing the mark, and then make the necessary changes. Because what is the goal? Perfection. Perfection. Yeah, we're aiming for perfection. We go to the next slide here. A couple scriptures that tell us what the goal is. Jesus said this, Luke 6, 40, the student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. What is Jesus saying? What is our goal? Perfection. To be just like Jesus. We're in perfection. We're, doing, we're supposed to be fully trained. We're supposed to live like Jesus. John then said this in 1 John 2, 6, whoever claims to live in him, that is whoever claims to live in Christ, must live as Jesus did. Is that a it's a pretty big bullseye, isn't it? That's the goal. So Paul says, listen to my appeal. If you want to hit the bullseye in darts, if you want to hit the bullseye in your spiritual life, the second thing you have to do is be focused. You have to know where you're aiming. I took great pride when I played a lot of darts. This triple 18 right here, this is my bread and butter. That's where I was. If I could... If I threw three darts, I was going to hit it at least once. I, I focused on where I was aiming for. You have to do that. Are you going for something in the double ring, the triple ring? Are you going for the bullseye? Where are you aiming? You've got to know where you're shooting, and you see only that. It's the only thing you see is that target. 
And even if you're aiming for the bullseye, you're not really aiming for the bullseye. You're really aiming for this one dot right here at the very center. That's your aim. That's your focus. Not anywhere within the bullseye. I'm, there's one singular point I'm trying to reach. And whatever your aim, you see nothing else. Paul gives the Corinthians a focus, something to focus on that had eluded them as a church. When he says, be of one mind. They had fallen, fall short of that. He says, be of one mind. Notice he doesn't say, just get along. That's not really the goal. The goal is not being able to be peaceable and love each other but not like each other. <laughs> be of one mind, he says. Because, look, you can get along and you can do really good work without being of one mind. It's possible, isn't it? If you've worked in a job, you understand that. People that you don't really get along with very well at all, you can still get the job done. And if you have any doubts about that, just look at NFL football teams and you'll see how many times does the quarterback and the star receiver can't stand each other. But they make a lot of touchdowns. Or, or the team backbites the coach in the media. Like you see this happen. There are a lot of teams that have literally won the Super Bowl, but nobody can stand each other. You can do good things and still not be of one mind. But brothers and sisters, we're not playing football. And we're really not in a game at all. In fact, sometimes we use the word like we're a team, but we're not really a team. We are somewhat, but that's not how we're fully described in Scripture. How does, what word does Paul use, and what word does Jesus use to describe us in the church? We are a body. We are a family, not a team. We, there's teamwork involved, but we are a family. We are a body, and we're called to a purpose. And that purpose means that we are to be of one mind. So what does that mean? To be of one mind. Well, it doesn't mean that we're going to agree on everything. We're not drones that are all pre-programmed to be absolutely identical in every way. We're going to disagree. We're going to have different thoughts in the election. That's okay. We're going to have different thoughts about what music we should sing. Here, do, should we sing hymns? Should we sing choruses or accommodations? We can disagree on that. That's okay. We can disagree on what we should study in Sunday school or in Bible studies or how we should study those. We can have those disagreements. It's okay. That doesn't mean we're not of one mind. To be of one mind means that we agree on the mission of the church. We know why we're here. We agree on the important doctrines of faith. We might disagree a little bit about what are things going to be like before Christ returns or Minor kind of issues, but the major things of the faith, we are in rock-solid agreement with one another on. The role of Scripture. And if we are of one mind, it means that we are committed to, even though we don't always see eye to eye and everything, we are committed to loving each other no matter what. We're going to love each other no matter what. But the Corinthians, they had not been of one mind. At all. They've been divided. They've been segregated from one another. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I think Peter's better. Who's preaching this Sunday? Because I'm going to decide whether I come to church based on who's behind the pulpit. And they really divided themselves based on that. And Satan had, pit, had them pitted against each other so much that they were failing in their mission as a church. And so Paul says it's time to do better. Brothers and sisters, be of one mind. That's your focus. The third thing when you're playing darts that you have to be able to do to hit the bullseye is you have to be still. You must be still. Uh, to succeed in darts or other similar games, you've got to have a good foundation. You've got to have a stance posture and balance because if you're unstable or you're moving too much you're never going to be able to get that thing where you need to go in darts ideally your arm is the only thing moving that's how you aim 
better. To, to hit the bullseye, your body has to be at peace. And Paul tells them here in 2 Corinthians uh, 13, he says, live in peace, meaning live in peace with one another. And you say, well, isn't that covered by be of one mind? Not necessarily. One mind has to do with purpose and committing to love, but being at peace with one another is not just about being, have oneness of purpose, but healthy relationships within the church. We go to the next slide. This is another passage Paul says in, in Ephesians 4 about unity in the church. It says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with love. <laughs> He's just trying to make sure I'm on my toes. If you're a pastor, you should have this memorized, right? Why are you using the cheat sheet? Bear with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called the one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Paul says make every effort. Now when he says that, does he imply that it's going to be easy? No. Otherwise he wouldn't have said make every effort. If it was easy to do this, he'd be like, yeah, you got it. Don't worry. I'm not even going to bother saying it. Make every effort. Effort. I mean, it's probably going to take more than one effort, and you're going to have to keep trying because you're going to get it wrong, and you're just going to have to stick at it. But it's possible, and it's possible only insofar as we focus on what we have in common. That's what Paul tells us here. What do we have in common? Uh, well, uh, there's one body. We are all one body. Not just us in this room, but all Christians. We are one body, right? The same Holy Spirit fills all of us. We may disagree on things. Guess what? The whole, same Holy Spirit's teaching each of us. And sometimes that we come to different conclusions about things. It's okay. But there's one spirit. Um, one hope. What is that hope? The hope of Christ's return, that we are going to be with him forever in heaven. We're going to be you know, sitting at the right hand of Jesus. And we're going to be with him, brothers and sisters, co-heirs with Christ. That is our one hope. Uh, one Lord, Jesus. I'll give him the easy Sunday school answer there. That's Jesus. Right? One faith, whether you're brethren, whether you're Mennonite, whether you're Baptist, whether you're non-denominational, whether you're Catholic, as long as your truth is in Jesus Christ and you're focused on him, that's one faith and one baptism. I don't care whether you were dunked three times forward, whether you were dipped one time backward, or they shot you with a super soaker. I don't care. There's one baptism because you're baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And one God and Father of all. That's what we have in common. And because of that, we should be able to have good relationships with one another. And you'll notice there that Paul doesn't say to make every effort to create unity. But to keep it. We can't create unity in Christ. We're united in Christ. He created it. We are united. Now, we can destroy what Jesus created, and that's a sad thing that it happens. But he says make every effort, effort to keep it. And so we need to be committed to being at peace with others in the faith. And maintain it as being of utmost importance. Because as Jesus said, and as Abraham Lincoln later said, quoting Jesus, a house what? Divided against itself cannot stand. We need to be at peace with one another. And then Paul closes verse 11 by saying, And the God of love and peace will be with you. You say, well, Pastor Jeff, I thought God was with us all the time. Why does Paul make it almost sound conditional? Like, if you do these things, then God will be with you. But if you don't, then God's not going to be with you. Don't read into that more than Paul means. God is always with us. But if we aim for perfection by seeing the target, by keeping our focus and being at peace, we'll hit the target. And even though God is with us, we'll get to see how. We'll see the evidence of God's presence with us more clearly. So as we close this morning... What do we do with this? 
What's the conclusion of the book of 2 Corinthians for us? How's your aim? How's, how's our aim? Not just you as an individual. Our church, how is our aim? Are we aiming for bullseye? Are we somewhere in here? Or are we just trying to hold on to the outside edge? How's our aim? Are you aiming for the center of God's will? For the center of obedience? Are you content just to be close to the target? And are you seeing the target making adjustments to like, wow, that, my arm wasn't right there. I'm aiming too high. Are you making adjustments so that you can hone in better on where we're trying to hit? Are you focused on being with, of one mind with others in Christ so that the purpose of Jesus is what is carrying you forward, carrying us forward? Is that our focus? And are we maintaining the bond of peace with other believers? Let's ask that question today and this week. There's another other thing I didn't recognize that I missed this until after I had kind of written this whole thing out. There's one other thing that you have to do to succeed in darts and to succeed at aiming for uh, dead center in your walk with Jesus, and that's you have to practice. I decided it probably wouldn't be a good idea to spend all 40 hours in my office this week just practicing darts. Or I might have hit all three bullseyes. You've got to practice. And you're going to get it wrong. And you just keep going. But your aim doesn't change. But we seek consistency. And may we do that in our own walks with Christ. May we do that as a church. I invite the worship team to come up and we're going to close with some songs. First, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, I thank you for all that we've learned in this Trek through the book of 2 Corinthians. God, I have learned a lot. I think we all have. And Lord, as we see the result of some of Paul's frustrations and difficulties with the Corinthian church, Lord, I think we can identify with a lot of it. Even though maybe our issues aren't the same as they were dealing with in Corinth, Lord, we often miss the target. Sometimes it's accidental. Sometimes it's just our flesh. We're weak. Jesus said, you know, to his disciples to pray because the, the, the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And sometimes our weakness just we fall short. Other times, if we're really honest, we weren't even aiming for the center. Help us to see that. Help us to make corrections. Help us to listen to the appeal of the word of God. Help us, Lord, to live with one purpose. Help us to be at peace with one another. Lord, help us to be willing just to keep going at it, keep practicing. Because the goal is the hope that we have of eternity with you. May that inspire us to keep going, to keep getting better. Thank you for hearing our prayers, Father, and I pray that you'd be with us as we close in worship. In Jesus' name, amen.